Anyway, we are in week three of this series called Reading the Signs. We're going to be starting off in Revelation 16. And today we're going to talk all about Armageddon. And in this shocking end times story, it's discovered that an asteroid is headed toward Earth, and the only one to stop it is Bruce Willis and a team of mine. And Aerosmith will write a beautiful song. (laughs) Wrong. Wrong Armageddon. We're not talking about that one today. Okay. Now, before I get into this, for real, all joking aside, I need a little levity here because you're going to see we're going to get pretty deep into the weeds of some things here today. And before I get started into this, I'm just going to tell you that there are many multiple theories and beliefs surrounding what I'm going to share with you today. And what I'm going to teach you, and out of this, we're going to basically be in Revelation, we're going to jump to Ezekiel, we're going to jump to Daniel, we're going to be all over the map. What this is going to be is what I believe is a possible interpretation of these scriptures. And there are many highly respected pastors, teachers, and scholars who will listen to this message I do today and say, you are wrong. And I will say, okay, because I don't have the ego to stand up here and tell you that I'm right, but I can honestly tell you that I've studied this and I've read through it, and this is where I am today. And who knows, by next year, it could be completely different. So let's go ahead and jump into this. And so as we do, let me just say, first off, that I believe in a literal, literal translation of the Bible, not a figurative. And what does that mean? First, it becomes important to notice that the Bible uses figurative language, I believe, to describe literal things. Jesus told parables, for example. Prophecies paint pictures. There are similes. There are metaphors. There are examples that we're going to read even in this first scripture of Revelation that's going to talk about three frogs coming out of the mouth of beasts. And you're going to think, are those like literal frogs that come out of literal beasts and whatever? That is figurative language that will describe a literal thing that will take place. That's how I interpret these things. And so, for example, we're going to talk a little bit about the millennial kingdom, which is the thousand-year reign of Jesus on the earth. And there's debate. Is that a literal thousand-year reign, or is it a figurative thousand-year reign? And some go back and forth and say, no, the thousand years is not literal. It's just meant to be a long time, a long period of time. Some think the thousand-year reign is happening now. Some think it's in the future. My point is, I'm going to interpret this in Revelation 20, that it says six different times a literal thousand years. So that's what I'm going to go with. Jesus has a literal thousand year reign. So we're going to jump into some of the stuff. We're going to start with Revelation 16, verse 12. And hang with me, and I'll make this as easily digestible as I can here, okay? The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up. To prepare the way for the king from the east. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet three unclean spirits like frogs. For they're demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go naked and be seen exposed. And they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. So remember last week when we read of Jesus saying there will be wars and rumors of wars. We've seen throughout history this is true. There's wars happening all the time. There are different conflicts that are rising everywhere. And we have a tendency to jump in and go, is this it? Is this it? Is this the end? Is this how it all happens? And we start to try to piece the puzzle together in our own minds of how we think it's going to play out. Armageddon, in this case, is different in that this is a war to end all wars. And the difference will be, it will be an outright spiritual war that makes its way into the physical realm. In other words, it's going to be where nations from all over gather together and just attack God and who God is as represented in the land of Israel, which is God's chosen land. And so we place a lot of emphasis in Armageddon on who the players are in this battle, who are the specific leaders who are going to be mounting a charge, what does this look like, and throughout 
ages and generations, how many times have believers looked and said, that person's the Antichrist. That person's the one that the Bible talks about. That person. And we want to make sure that we can figure it out. I mean, in World War II, for example, who did everyone think probably was the Antichrist? Hitler. If you go down through the ages of many different times, there were other emperors who wanted to take over the world. Napoleon. There were all these names that you could throw out there, and each time, I bet, those who were believers in Scripture would go, it's happening. And they would look at these times at the end. What we can't lose sight of, though, in the Battle of Armageddon, which is the battle to end all battles, is that all nations will gather against God in unbelief, but they will not succeed. And we see this, and we see why the nations will gather together and attack God in the scripture that we just read. If you followed along, we have visual language that says there are plague-like frogs that come from the mouths of the beast, the false prophet, and then another false prophet. Revelation 16 is a chapter, if you read it in its entirety, And you've probably heard of this before. The seven bowls of God's wrath that are poured out that lead up to this time of Armageddon. And just to to give you a a brief summary of what they are, the the angels pour out these bowls. The first one is a bowl that's that's poured out on the earth that brings painful sores to all the people. The second is a bowl that's poured out on the sea, which turns the sea blood red. The third, on the rivers and on the springs, which turns to blood as well. This is all visual of what happened in the Exodus story, right? The fourth one is poured out on the sun and the earth, it says, becomes so hot that it becomes scorched with fire. And the heat is just unbearable. And then the fifth bowl is poured out on the beast and its kingdom. We're going to get to who that is here in a moment. And the kingdom of the beast will be plunged into darkness, But there's an interesting verse that says here, and people still will not repent. And then the verse we just read in chapter 16, the Euphrates River will dry up and the kings of the east will join the battle. Now let me quickly say this. These bowls of wrath being poured out on the whole world are affecting everyone And that's why, as I've read through this and and really tried to study this, I try to ask myself the question, where are believers in Christ when it comes to to this time, when God's wrath is being poured out and this time of great tribulation is really coming to an end? And my answer to that is, I don't believe Christians will be around for it. I believe the rapture will take place before all of these events happen and will be spared from God's wrath. We're not spared from tribulations and trials and things because Jesus said we will have tribulations. We will have trials. But I believe in this end times here where there's a seven-year reign that's going to take place that we'll get get to here in a little bit. At the end of that seven-year reign is where God's wrath is poured out on everyone. And those who call upon the name of Jesus, I believe, are spared from that because we don't receive God's wrath. So, With that, let's go back to these three plague-like frogs. It says, one comes from the mouth of a dragon, another comes from the mouth of a beast, and then another comes from the mouth of the false prophet. The dragon is Satan, the beast is the Antichrist, the false prophet is a third who will rise up and basically be the promoter of false teachings, the promoter of all of these evil things that are taking place And if you want to read about that, you can write Revelation 13 and learn more about those figures. Those three demonic spirits give convincing arguments into the ears of people who are willing to believe. If you want to ask the question, why will nations mount up and, and mount an attack against God? Why would this even happen? I present to you what I just said. One, if you remove believers in Christ from this entire equation, if you remove the stopgap, those who say, wait a minute, it says in Scripture that this is all going to happen. You remove that element from it. There is nothing there stopping nations who don't believe, people who don't believe from going their own way against God and mounting an attack against God, especially when you take into account that there are three demonic spiritual forces in the heavenly realms in the ears of people saying, 
God is worthless. Go against God. And the attack could happen there. So if you have your Bible open, if you go to verse 15, in in that section where as we're getting this picture of these three demonic frogs and the spirits and all this, and you're going, this is so weird, Pastor Josh. I get it. But go to verse 15, and you have Jesus who inserts a line there. Some Bibles will even put this in red. And Jesus says, in light of all this, as this attack is mounting and coming here, Jesus says, I come like a thief in the night. Stay awake. In other words, he's talking to those who will have come along and believed in this time. And get ready, prepare yourself. There is a battle that is going to be happening here. The stage is set for it. I was reading through Pastor Austin's notes, and he taught a Revelation class recently. And one of the things he brought out, which I thought was really good, is he said, there's a couple times where Jesus talks about coming like a thief in a night, but he's not referring to believers in that. He's telling others, be ready. I might have messed that up anyway, but you get, kind of get the point. Verse 16 then comes along, and it's the only time in Scripture that the, words, the word Armageddon appears. And it's interesting because John, who we believe is the writer of Revelation, writes this word Armageddon, and it's really not one word. It's a combination of two Hebrew words that he brings. One is Har, which means mountain, and Megiddo, which is basically a place. It's a plain land in ancient Israel. You can go there even today. Armageddon then, in the way that it's written here, actually means Mount Megiddo. But it's in a valley. It's not a mountain. Isn't this strange? What would give it language that would would make the the location of this epic battle be a mountain? And, And there are different theories and people who, who try to figure out what it could be. But let me present to you my theory, all right? In the first week, we talked in this series about the nation of Israel. We talked about the territory that is God's and God's chosen land and his chosen people. And Israel, interesting enough, connects three continents. Three continents that have vast importance, Europe, Asia, and Africa, Megiddo is not a mountain, but in the sense that it connects those three continents, it's very important in its strategic location. And for centuries and centuries, it has been a place of epic battles. Even if you go down into the past and you go scripturally, you can see battles from Gideon, Samson, King Josiah, Deborah, and more. But if you want to come more recent even... It was a place that Napoleon himself remarked in his conquest that Megiddo is the perfect territory for the battle of all battles to take place. In, AD, in 300 AD, Alexander the Great had a conquest to rule the entire Middle East, and he said this of that territory, he who controls that territory controls the world. So this could, could be a reason why this place is elevated to such an important degree. So I'm throwing my little two cents in there and going, it is a raised up Mount Megiddo, a place of vast importance of where this battle of Armageddon could possibly take place. And so the question you must ask, because scripture tells us of this battle, who are the players? Who could be involved in this? And the pouring out of the sixth bowl gave us a little bit of a clue because it told us that kings from the east will come when the Euphrates River dries up. There are all different kind of natural ways that that people try to figure out what are some ways the Euphrates River could dry up and whatever it may be, but it could very well be a supernatural way that God dries up this river and opens a pathway so that nations, kings from the east will come through and join an allegiance of others who are already coming against this area for an attack that would take place in Armageddon. But here's the thing, before we jump into this, only God knows. And I would caution everyone, as we we learn or when we read about these times, ask yourself this question, how come God didn't make it plain as day? Why didn't God just go right on the nose with this stuff and say, here's how it ends, 
Here's exactly who's involved. Let me give you the specific names. Let me give you the, the absolute, down to the most minute detail. Why didn't God do it? Because he doesn't want you to know. Now, it gives you hints and gives you clues and lets you figure out and all those things. And we do a fabulous job of wanting to piece together all the puzzles of life, whether we're right, right or wrong. But I do think there's a reason where God says, you won't know. Paul somewhat writes about this when he says in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but soon face to face. There's some things you're just not going to know until it's right in front of your face. And so all of these different theories and beliefs and interpretations and things that we think are right, we need to just proceed with caution and understand that only God is the one who could say definitively, here's what's going to happen. Here's how it will play out. So, with that in mind, flip over to the Old Testament, go to Ezekiel 38. And we're about to have the most end times fun you've ever had in your life. You're going to jump out of your chair and say, I'm so glad I came here today, right? That's right. Ezekiel 38, I'm going to read 1 through 9. We'll go through most of this chapter. This is a prophecy... If you remember in week one, and we were in 30, Ezekiel 36 and 37, by the time we get to 38, this is a prophecy God gives to Ezekiel that looks to the latter days. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, set your face toward Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn you about and put, put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you out, and all your army, horses, and horsemen, all of them clothed in full armor, a great host, all of them with buckler and shield, wielding swords. Persia, Cush, and Put are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all his hordes, Beth to Gorma, from the uttermost parts of the north will all his hordes, many peoples are with you. Be ready and keep ready, you and all your hosts that are assembled about you, and be a guard for them. After many days, you will be mustered. In the latter years, you will go against the land that is restored from war, the land whose people were gathered from many peoples upon the mountains of Israel, which had been a continual waste. Its people were brought out from the peoples and now dwell securely, all of them. You will advance, coming on like a storm. You will be like a cloud covering the land, you and all your hordes and many peoples with you. Let's stop there for right now. So this is God who says to Ezekiel, prophesy and tell to these lands that were named. This is God speaking directly to those nations. And in verse 8, there's a bit of a clue that gives us some timing to this event. Not specifically, but, but vaguely, and that we're told, after many days, they will be mustered, these, these nations. And in the latter years, they will go against the land that is restored from war. So I believe we're talking about Israel here and these nations that rise up against this territory. Remember Revelation, in this battle, we have kings in, from the east that are already coming, and here we're told about all these from the north that are coming. And we're introduced in the beginning to Gog of Magog. Gog is a leader. We don't know who this is. It's a ruler, a king, a czar, whatever leadership title you want to put, but we're talking about a person here who is a leader over Magog. And what nation is Magog? This is where things get dicey. In Genesis 10, we're told that Magog was a grandson of Noah, and he and his descendants, Magog, traveled north after the flood and settled in a northern territory that is most likely northern Asia, possibly eastern Europe. And today, we know this territory is Russia. And there have been efforts through the years to attach Russia to this end times battle, and that could very well be the case. Many books you read, even the one that I recommended in the newsletter, will will declare that Russia is the one that's being spoken of here as Magog. And there is some interesting things. In verse 2, Gog is called the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. And some translations of Scripture will include a third name in there called Rosh. Now, 
doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that maybe you can connect Russia and Rosh in a different sort of way. Did you know there's even an interesting historical legend that said the word Meshach there is actually an interpretation of the word Moscow. And it was founded, Moscow or Meshach, by the son of Japheth. Now, who was Japheth? Japheth was the father of Magog. So, this is a stretch a little bit. Who knows if this is exactly what God is talking about, but there are some who take these, these leaps and say, hey, clearly we're talking about Russia in this case. But let me caution you with this. God is giving us an end times description of what happens at Armageddon. And we don't know which nations will be in place when this time comes. It could be different names. And if you start attaching your beliefs to these things and saying it has to be that nation, it has to be that specific place, what happens when that nation is no more? For example, what if in the 80s I gave this message and I said it's clearly referring to the Soviet Union? And if it's not the Soviet Union, then it's not it. Well, then my whole thing has fallen apart, hasn't it? So that's my point. Be careful when we do these things. Here's what God wants us to know for certain. Whether it is Russia or whether it is someone else, the army will come from the north. It will be a large, militarily skilled nation that will come from there. It will be referred to as Magog. In Ezekiel, Ezekiel 38, 4 through 6, here's what God says he'll do. And I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you out, all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed in full armor, a great host, all of them with buckler and shield, wielding swords. Persia, Cush, and Put are with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his hordes, Beth to Gorma from the uttermost parts of the north with all his hordes, and many peoples are with you. And I wanted to read that again because I think that visualization of God putting hooks in the jaws almost makes you see like a fisherman who's got good bait on the hook, throwing that bait out there and going, come on, they're right here. Drawing in this attack when you ask, why would these nations rise up and do this? So if you think in the spirit world of these, these three frogs that we're told of in Revelation 16 that are spreading false lies and, and raising up these nations, and then you have God saying, yeah, come on, Put a hook in your jaw. Come on, do this. You'll succeed. And you would say, well, why would the enemy, why would the devil be so stupid? Why would the devil, who knows God wins, do this? And let me ask you this. Why did the devil send Jesus to the cross? Now, God sent Jesus to the cross, but why did the devil follow through? Why did the devil torment? Why did the devil tempt? Why did the devil go at Jesus with everything, knowing that Jesus would win? Because the devil hates God. You love God. The devil hates you. The devil doesn't care. The devil, devil doesn't care about wins and losses, whatever it may be. If the loss is going to happen, take as many down as you possibly can. Convince them that God can be defeated. And God says, I'll put the hook in your jaw. So we're told of multiple nations who will join Magog. And here's some modern day names for you. We're told Persia, Cush, and Put. Persia is modern-day Iran, Iraq. Cush is Ethiopia. Put is modern-day Libya. Gomer could be Eastern Europe, Germany, think those places, places that were under Soviet Union rule. Beth Tagorma, which possibly could be modern-day Turkey. And again, be cautious when we start putting these names on there. But well, what, what the whole plan is going to be is to see this beautiful, perfect territory that, that can be taken over. There can be plunder. There's, the Bible says there's gold, there's wealth, there's, there's a strategic uh, gain to be had from taking over this territory. Whatever it may be, the nations see that and want to take control. And if we go back to week one, ask yourself the question, why is there always conflict in that area? Always. There's a specific reason. We know it spiritually because of God. But then there's also, because I've said of what Napoleon said, what Alexander said, what those who have said through the ages, there just is a great value attached to that land. So let's continue Ezekiel 38, verse 10. Thus says the Lord God, 
now that the hooks have been put in the jaws and, they're, and they're, they're coming, on that day, thoughts will come into your mind and you will devise an evil scheme and you will say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages. I will fall upon the quiet people who dwell securely, all of them dwelling without walls and having no bars or gates, to see spoil and carry off plunder, to turn your hand against the waste places that are now inhabited and the people who are gathered from nations who have acquired livestock and goods who dwell at the center of the earth. So these verses here then beg the question, when, when could all this possibly happen? Because this land of Israel that we're talking about here is described as a place that has unwalled villages, that is dwelling securely, that has no bars or no gates, and, and doesn't take a rocket scientist to, to know that that's not describing right now. As that, that land is covered by some of the, the biggest military might that there is, there's walls everywhere, there's territories, all this stuff that is planned out to prevent against attack 24 7. So, so what we're reading here doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. And so let me jump into the world of now theory and my belief as we look at this. Because I think God can strategically move quickly to get us to a place of what we just read. And how do I think? If I believe that the rapture will take place and remove believers in Christ and the church is removed from the picture, that sets up a time according to scripture, for a seven-year tribulation to take place. And the rapture itself that we're going to talk about in a few weeks refers to Jesus carrying off his church. It's in 1 Thessalonians 4. It's in 1 Corinthians 15. When Jesus removes his church and snatches them away, believers in Christ, and a seven-year tribulation begins, a great tribulation, The Bible tells us that there will be one who will rise up. One who will rise up and become a leader. One who will rise up and people will look to and will believe. And if I take my theory in this of the the rapture, when something of a cataclysmic nature takes place, whether it's devastating or confusing, whatever it may be, we as people look to to leaders. We look to direction. If you remove the God element from this then, and those who believe in Jesus, those who remain are not going to look to God for the answer. They're going to look to a person. And so that elevates and sets a stage for a scenario where an antichrist could come into play. And let me give you a a real world example. You remember 9-11? When the planes hit the towers and the buildings came down, and we, we, many of us could say, here's where I was when that took place. And we remember the feeling of what that was like. I remember the first thought I had. Where's the president? Did any of you have that thought? George Bush was in the White House at the time. And I remember thinking, where is he? Like, is he safe? Where's the attack? What's going to happen next? Is there another area that's going to be hit? Whatever it may be. And I still remember the first time then when they started showing where he was and the different things that they were doing to protect the president at that time. My point is, when devastation happens, we look to a physical leader. So if something of a cataclysmic nature happened, and just think about it, if the church, believers in Christ, are gone in a rapture, An entire world that is left behind will look to a leader, someone to guide them and lead them. And in this scenario, Daniel 9, verse 27, tells us this as a look ahead to the future of this leader. And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. And for half of the week, he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate, until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. What this is talking about is that leader, the Antichrist who comes. I don't have time to go into all of Daniel when it comes to 70 weeks that Daniel talks about in his end times prophecy. But this happens here at the end, in the 70th week, describing a time of tribulation and a leader who would rise up. So, if you're still with me, Here's what I think. 
seven years great tribulation time. The Antichrist rises up. The church is gone. In the first three and a half years, there is a time of peace, unparalleled peace, because this leader has bargained and made this contract with the people for those first three and a half years. There's no need for the walled villages. There's no need to, for, to pre prevent attack from enemy, whatever, because everyone's living in harmony. Three and a half years into that, the halfway point is when that all ends. And at that halfway point is when Ezekiel 38, in my mind, begins the plan that starts to take place. And the nations see this unwalled, perfect territory being available. Nations from the north come. And then in that, the bowls start being poured out. But nobody connects this with God because of those evil spirits and demonic forces in the background are making convincing arguments. And then, if you get to the end of those three and a half years, is when you see this battle finally play out in full force in the Battle of Armageddon. So if you're with me, I believe that the, the events in Ezekiel 38 and in Revelation 16 through 20 are one battle that will culminate and that will take place. So can I present to you a question that I have had since I was nine years old? Where is America? You ever wondered that? Like, where's the United States in all this stuff? And, I, and I'll, I'll just admit as I go into this, because I remember from a young age having this question and going, I mean, surely, like, we're a superpower. Surely we're not just going to be on the side and let this happen. Whatever it may be. And if, to be, to be truthful, there's really not a whole lot you can go with here. But if you want to ask that question, here's, here's a possible. Y'all do that with me. Possible. Okay, I want you to hear that so you don't say that I'm for sure preaching this. But here's a little nugget from Ezekiel. In verse 13, Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish and all its leaders will say to you, have you come to see spoil? Have you assembled your hosts to carry off plunder and to carry away silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods and to seize great spoil? Now, we're, we're told of three places here, Sheba, Dedan, Tarshish. Sheba, most believe, is modern-day Saudi Arabia. Dedan could be Yemen. And this is just guesses here of what could possibly be. Now, the merchants of Tarshish, is, Tarshish I can't even say it, is where it gets interesting because there is a chance this could be Spain and England, especially when you think of the merchants and the trade routes and the different ships and all throughout history. Now, what is interesting about those areas, Spain and England, is they are known for sending out and colonizing. And the translation of scripture that I just read here said to the merchants of Tarshish and its leaders. But some of those original translations of scripture didn't say and its leaders. It said and its young lions. So if you wanted to take a leap, and it is a leap, that scripture there says to the merchants of Tarshish and its young lions that they will ask questions. They will ask questions of the nations who are attacking and say, why are you doing this? But they will stay on the sidelines. And you may ask, how could they stay on the sidelines? And for me, I go back to because there are no believers there present. There will be new believers and people coming along who believe, but the original, the church, won't be there to provide maybe the context of what is going on. So again, this is all possible stuff, but it gives you somewhat of, of some insight there. One thing is certain, though, and Scripture says this, no one will come to God's defense. So God will then take matters into his own hands. And so, to me, in my theory of this, if the seven-year tribulation in the first three and a half years is peace, and then the remaining three and a half years becomes the setup for the battle plan, and then a war that begins, by the time you get to the end of those seven years, God takes the matters into his hands. And in verse 14 of Ezekiel 38, God says, Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to Gog, thus says the Lord God, on that day, 
When my people in Israel are dwelling securely, will you not know it? You will come from your place out of the uttermost parts of the north, you and many peoples with you, all of them riding horses, a great host and a mighty army. You will come against my people Israel like a cloud covering the land. In the latter days, so in the end times, I will bring you against my land that the nations may know me. When through you, O Gog, I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. Thus says the Lord God, Are you he of whom I spoke in former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel, who in those days prophesied for years that I would bring you against them? How cool is this? So God is just saying through the prophets to those nations, you're doing exactly what I said you would do. All of it's playing out. And it's all playing out because all of the glory and honor and praise, everyone is going to see now that it's always been real. That I've always been the one in control. I've always been the one in charge. My name should be lifted up and glorified. And it is here now we start to see the same language that's being used in Ezekiel and in Revelation I'll continue on in Ezekiel first, and then I'm going to compare it to Revelation, and you all just tell me what you think. Verse 18, on that day, the day that Gog shall come against the land of Israel, declares the Lord God, my wrath will be roused in my anger. For in my jealousy and in my blazing wrath, I declare, on that day, there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. The fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens and the beasts of the fields, all the creeping things that creep on the ground, All the people who are on the face of the earth shall quake at my presence. They're going to see what is happening. There will be a great understanding that it's it's all true. And the mountains shall be thrown down. The cliffs shall fall. Every wall shall tumble to the ground. I will summon a sword against Gog on all the mountains, declares the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother. In other words, they're going to start fighting each other because what do you do when things start going really, really bad? Infighting. And they start battling each other because here they thought this should be a victory and now defeat is imminent. They're going to have pestilence and bloodshed. God says, I will enter into judgment with him. I will rain upon him and his hordes and the many peoples who are with him, torrential rains and hailstones, fire and sulfur. What we're getting here is a description of the second coming of Jesus. Jesus. A return, an end, a victory in this Armageddon battle. And if you go back now, if you if you marked in your book, go back to Revelation 16. And what is the seventh bowl? Keep that in mind. What we just read about Ezekiel 38 in verse 17 of Revelation, the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air. Who is the ruler of the air in this world? Satan, the devil. This bowl is poured out on the devil, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, it is done. Reminiscent of three other words that we know in Scripture, it is finished. And there were flashes of lightning, rumbles, peals of thunder, and a great earthquake such as there had never been since man was on the earth. So great was that earthquake that the great city was split into three parts, and the cities and the nations fell, and God remembered Babylon the great to make her drain the cup of wine of the fury of his wrath. So his wrath is being poured out. Every island fled away. No mountains were to be found. And great hailstones, weighing a 100 pounds each, fell from heaven on the people. And they cursed God for the plague of the hail because the plague was so severe. So in these two here, what are the common things we see? A great earthquake, We see cities split into three parts, cliffs that are falling, mountains that are going away, islands are gone, nations fall, torrential rains and hailstorms. And what will happen in Ezekiel 38, 3? God says, I will show my greatness and my holiness and make myself known in the eyes of many nations. There are some who will know that I am the Lord. It says, 
there are many who will know that I am the Lord. How will God's greatness and holiness be known? How will the eyes of the nations know that it is Jesus who utterly destroys with the sword of judgment and victory? And I know I've given you a lot of verses, but I'll throw this verse out at you. Revelation 19, verse 11. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. In righteousness he judges and he makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called the Word of God. Who are we talking about? Jesus. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. There are, are some who believe that it is the church, it is the believers who are coming with them. Those who have been raptured away, following after him in this epic victory that's taking place. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has his name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so that picture is one that I want to leave you with. In all the things that I've said here today, of which I will admit, I very well could be wrong about the details and all that. But what matters most is this. He is coming again. He is returning victorious. And I love that picture of him returning with these other nations who probably think that their victory is inevitable because look around today, so many think that God is useless, that there is no need for God in life, that they are victorious over God. But in the end here, we see Jesus returning with truth. It says he is faithful and true and in righteousness he will judge and make war, and he will end it. And this, this here is what will usher in the millennial reign of Jesus, which I believe a thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth. Ezekiel 39 will go on to say that the victory in this battle will be so decisive, so many from the nations will fall, that for, it will take seven years to burn and get rid of all of their armor and all of their fighting equipment. It will take seven months to clean the land of all of the bodies that will be dead from the fallout of the war. So when you start putting all of these things together, that's where I just see the beginning of that thousand-year reign being cleanup time of cleansing the earth and Jesus beginning that time. And so I think the most important thing for all of us to know is this. Where are you in your relationship with Christ? If what I am saying here is true, if, if in fact calling on the name of Jesus means you become a part of being delivered from these things and God's wrath being poured out, then my, my question to you is this. What are you waiting on? Are you wanting to see until someone gives you a definitive, decisive explanation for everything? It's not going to happen. The only way that you come to Christ is that the Holy Spirit has been working on your heart, drawing you in to saying, I want to believe in you, Jesus. Fill in that gap of distance where help my unbelief. And so let me ask you this. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, maybe today, would you call on him today? Would you be on his side? Would you be on one of those horses who is following after him in a victorious manner? And if you don't, let me pray for you now and pray that you will. So pray with me. Lord Jesus, we come to you now and I lift up everybody in this room. I lift up those watching online. Lord, I know a lot of times this, some of these things in your word when it comes to these end times can be very confusing and we, some of it just seems so out there we don't know what to, to make of it. But one thing is true. One thing is holy. One thing is faithful and that, that's you, Lord. 
And there are those in this room, those who are watching online who need to call on you as Lord and Savior. I pray that they would receive you and begin the journey. Begin the journey of growing in a relationship with you. Walking closer to you. Calling you Lord and Savior. That they would repent of their sin and walk away from all these things that the world says is okay. Walk away from it and just dedicate their lives to you to be holy and pleasing. I pray that that would happen today, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.